This morning, we're privileged to have with us uh, Diego Ramos and his wife, Casilla. And they are from Brazil. They just arrived in the United States from Fortaleza this week. Um, I met Diego and his wife at a camp in uh, Brazil several years ago. I think they were shortly just married. I don't think you had any children yet. You didn't. And I remember this young guy who had about every kind of tape recorder under the sun, it seemed. And he was constantly using every technology that, that I don't even know how to run. He was running. And uh, he, God really used him. And I remember our son Rick and I were together in this camp on an island and uh, isolated there. It was a great time together with, uh, with the people. I've been to Brazil several times. And I love it there. I love the people there. I love, I could live there actually if uh, it were suitable for us to do so. My heart goes out to the ministry that God has taken Diego, who has graduated from seminary, from John MacArthur Seminary, the Master Seminary. And God has used him greatly there, and he's one of the leaders there. I know as Pastor Jen Juan, I've been able to preach in his church and it's just exciting for me to see guys who are teaching men to preach the gospel in foreign countries and then to see the men who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and grow in grace and knowledge also take that gospel and spread it out through the rest of the world from Brazil. He reminded us this morning that Brazil is the second send missionary sending country next to the United States. So, Diego, we welcome you to our church and looking forward to the message you have for us. Thank you for the applause beforehand. And so it means I don't need to do a good work here. Uh, so I already had the applause. <laughs> okay, it's a, a great pleasure for me uh, and my wife to be here. Uh, we have... Uh, appreciated the ministry of Pastor Rod Gordon in Brazil, and uh, it's our second time here, and we have enjoyed the last time we had, and uh, we are enjoying this time too. Uh, we came in the summer last time, now in the winter. It's, uh, it's good. Uh, it's, uh, it's different, but it's good anyways. So, yeah, uh, I, w I would invite you to join me, open your Bibles in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Yeah, we're, we're going to read the last clause in chapter 7 uh, and then jump into chapter 8. The Word of God says, and when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month, uh, seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra described stood on a wooden platform that they had made for that purpose, and beside him stood uh, Mattithiah, Shema, Anaiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseiah on the right hand, and Pedaiah, uh, Mishael, Malkiah, Hashum, Hashbadana, uh, Zechariah, and Meshulam on the left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, 
and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Cherebia, uh, Yamim, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodia, Maaseya, Kelita, Azaria, Josabad, Hanan, Pelaia, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people down, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that, uh, that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' uh, houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should proclaim it and publish publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out of the hills, go out to the hills and... uh, Bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and, and other leafy trees uh, to make booths, as it's written. So the people went out and brought them uh, and made booths for th- themselves, each on his roof and in the courts and in, in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in it in the booths for uh, for from the days of Joshua J- uh, Joshua the son of Nun uh, to that day the people of Israel had not done so and there was very great rejoicing and day by day from the first day to the last day. He read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Let's pray. Father, we come before your word because we know that here we find the words of life. Here, O God, we find your revelation to mankind and We want to study it with carefulness and we want to apply it to our lives. Help us, God, to understand your word and uh, may your spirit grip our hearts and transform us each day in the likeness of your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Not long ago, we celebrated uh, 500 years of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, when we think about this crucial event in the history of the church, our our mind cannot help but think about men like uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and other men who demonstrated so much courage to face uh, the Catholic Church. So as we reflect about these men, we we reflect about their education, their qualities, their efforts, Uh, and things like that that we think contributed to uh, for them to accomplish what they had accomplished. So we tend to think about the success of these men, the the ministry of certain men of God in history, and what they accomplished for God's kingdom as a fruit of their bravery, uh, impetuous and strong personality, intellectual capacity, and uh, power of uh, leadership, influence, uh, availability of resources, 
We think of uh, those things as uh, the main factors in the success of those men of God. Many of us here are familiar with the ministry of Pastor John MacArthur, who has uh, had a fruitful ministry of teaching and preaching God's word, and who has uh, impacted really the, the entire world uh, with the word of God, uh, and who has been uh, almost 50 years in the same church. And uh, one, in one occasion, in a, one of the Q&As that uh, we had with him uh, during my time in seminary, he called the, uh, our attention to one factor, uh, an important factor about his ministry that is uh, key to understand the success of any other man of God who has made great things for God's kingdom. He was asked about uh, his time, uh, what would explain his time at Grace Community Church for so long. And uh, he said to us that uh, the fact that I'm here at Grace Community Church for 44 years is not a testimony about me. It's a testimony to the fact that the Bible is, is inexhaustible. And the Word of God made and makes the difference in his ministry. It was uh, the impact of the ministry of men like John MacArthur or Charles Spurgeon and many other prominent preachers uh, and pastors in history is a testimony that the Word of God makes the difference. The impact that the, the Protestant Reformation had and even reaches us to this day is a testimony to the fact that the Word of God made and makes the difference. Uh, the impact that uh, uh, the great revival under uh, George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards uh, is also a testimony that the Word of God makes and, make, uh, and, uh, and made the difference in their ministries. All of these men accomplished what they accomplished. Be uh, they had the impact that they had only as a consequence of their commitment and faithfulness to the Word of God. The great question before us today is, the Word of God makes the difference in your life. The Word of God makes the difference in my life. And today, we are gonna meditate in one of the uh, most riveting pas uh, passages that I, I have read uh, recently, uh, which is this passage in, in Nehemiah 8, verses one through 18. And it, 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 this passage manifests clearly what happens when the Word of God makes the difference in the life of the people of God. And this passage, uh, we're gonna see highlighted five elements that must characterize our, our attitude in relation to the Word of God so that it, it can make a difference in our lives too. Uh, we're gonna see the enthusiasm for the Word of God, the exaltation of the Word of God, the understanding of the Word of God, the effect of the Word of God, and the execution of the Word of God, or the obedience to the Word of God, as you. And so, if we, if we want our lives not to be mediocre, we need to examine ourselves if these qualities, these elements are present in our lives, in our attitude to the Bible. And uh, as we, uh, as we uh, commit ourselves and are faithful to the Word of God, I believe God can use us in ways that we would never expect. That God can use us to impact the world in, the, in ways that we would never expect. And uh, as we arrive to, to Nehemiah chapter eight, we, we need to understand a little bit of the context here. Uh, the, verse, the end of verse 73, uh, 773, says that when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. We need to understand a little bit of the context here because we, uh, we need to draw correct principles about, uh, uh, from this text. And uh, so this, te this text uh, mentions the seventh month, but what are the events that brought the people to this point in history that uh, help us to understand better what is going on here? Uh, the, the period uh, of history uh, where this passage uh, is found is called the post-exilic period. And it, uh, it follows a period of 135 years that the, the northern kingdom of Israel, the divided kingdom, uh, had uh, been taken 
to captivity in Assyria by the Assyrians. Uh, in 70 years, uh, it, it follows 70 years after the, the southern kingdom, whose capital was Jerusalem, was taken to captivity by uh, uh, Babylon, who had conquered Assyria. So these empires, they destroyed the Solomonic Temple, they destroyed the city of Jerusalem, they destroyed the walls of the city, and uh, really those who remained in the city of Jerusalem were in a worse position, uh, worse condition than those who had been taken to captivity. They, were, they had no resources, they were completely unprotected from their enemies around, and their situation was worse than those who were taken to captivity. But all this calamity that the people of Israel had faced uh, to this point was uh, the result of the judgment of God that had been predicted since the times of Moses. God had uh, promised to Israel that if they ha did not keep the commandments of God, the, uh, the conditions uh, proposed in the covenant made between them and God, if they turned themselves to other gods, he would take them out of the promised land and, the, and he would send them to a distant nation, a nation. And we read that in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 24, says, all the nations will say, why has the Lord done uh, thus to this land? What caused the heat of his great anger? Then people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, and, when, uh, and went and served, uh, uh, served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day. But God also promised in the following passage in chapter 30, that this judgment was not permanent, was temporary. In verse uh, four of chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, we say, if our outcasts are in the uh, uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land of your, uh, that your fathers possess, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your offspring. And uh, we know the exact time of this exile from the prophecy of Jeremiah. If you read Jeremiah 25, 11, 29, 10, you, you see that uh, God promised that uh, uh, 70 years they would be in captivity. And that was so. The people were ready to return after, uh, after their time of discipline. And the, the people returned in three stages. The first under the, the leadership of Zerubbabel and Jeshua uh, with uh, orders of uh, King Cyrus of Persia to, re, uh, to rebuild the temple uh, of Jerusalem. But uh, as we learn in, in the book of Ezra, uh, the enemies outside, outside and the spiritual uh, lethargy of the people inside brought the, the works to a halt and was only concluded 16 years later under the leadership of Ezra. So the second stage came, uh, uh, the second stage of the, the exiles returned under Ezra, this, uh, a scribe. He was a priest of, uh, uh, of Aaron's uh, lineage and Ezra came with order, uh, orders of uh, King uh, Artaxerxes uh, to fulfill uh, the, the task of uh, reestablishing uh, the service in the new reconstructed temple uh, with the Levites and uh, the gatekeepers and the music musicians and everything that was needed. Ezra was a man of great devotion to the Word of God. And Ezra uh, chapter 7 verse 10 says that, uh, uh, that Ezra had disposed his heart to search the law of the Lord 
to obey it and to teach it to the people of Israel. And that's what he did. Under Ezra, under his leadership, a spiritual reformation began to take place in Israel after the exile. The third stage, the third stage of the return of the, the Israelites happened under the leadership of Nehemiah. He came with a mission of uh, reconstructing uh, the, the, the walls of Jerusalem, uh, also with order of the same king, Ar Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah received news from, uh, from Jerusalem that the, that the inhabitants of Jerusalem, even after the temple had been reconstructed, uh, reconstructed had, uh, were living in great misery. And they were unprotected from the enemies around them. And the, uh, the same enemies who, who tried to thwart the, the, the work to rebuild the temple. And so Nehemiah is very sad. Uh, he, he works uh, in, the, in the king's palace. He has a prominent position in the king's palace. And he's sad because of, uh, of the news that he received from his people. So Nehemiah prays to God. He confesses the sins of the nations. He recognizes that the, the explanation for their calamity was the, their despise to the word of God. And he also confessed that the, the only solution, the only way back to the blessings of God for the nation of Israel is for them to return to obedience to the word of God. So he, he asked for a favor before the king so that he may be allowed to return and bring some with him to, to rebuild the temple. And God grants him favor. God answers his, his prayer. And the king allows Nehemiah to return with some people to rebuild the, the walls of Jerusalem. And like Zerubbabel, with the first return, he also faced opposition, slander from the enemies uh, around them who tried to thwart this work again. But with the help of the good hand of the Lord, if you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, you see that theme uh, constantly. The good hand of the Lord helped us. And so he fulfilled the task. He finished the walls. He re repopulated the city according to the families. Chapter 7 talks about that. Uh, uh, everyone who could prove that he was from such and such family was allotted a place in the city. And that's what, where we, are, we come in. Every person was in his city. And uh, uh, they, they are, are here now, gathered together to listen to the word of God. And that's, uh, and that's here, that it's here that we see the five elements that should characterize our attitude to the word of God if we want it to make a difference in our lives. And this, the first element that we see is the enthusiasm for the word of God. Verse 1 and 3. And all the people gathered as one man into the square uh, before the water gate. And they told Ezra the, the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses so uh, that the Lord had commanded to Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, and all those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. This was the beginning of an, a new year. The, the seventh month uh, was the month where uh, the people of Israel celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacle, the Feast of Booths. Uh, that reminded them of their, uh, their time of pilgrimage, uh, uh, wandering in the desert, living in tents when they were delivered from Egypt. So the first day of this month, the seventh month in the religious calendar, uh, came to be the first month of the uh, civil calendar uh, because of the importance of it. So this day was celebrated with trumpets and sacrifices, extra sacrifices every month, every beginning of month, the, the people should uh, bring sacrifices to the Lord. But in the, on the seventh month, which was the new year, they, they should bring more sacrifices because it was the, the beginning of the, the month, the, the, the year. So they celebrated with trumpets and sacrifices. But uh, our text doesn't mention any of those things. 
It doesn't mention trumpets. It doesn't mention people bringing sac sacrifices, just people rallying together. And uh, the people here did not remember uh, the requirements of the law. And uh, you, sh you must recall that at this point, the nation had been over a hundred years away from their land without priests, without Levites, without a temple to, uh, to, to accomplish what God had prescribed in the law of Moses. In fact, many here did not even know that there was a law until Ezra came into the scene in the, in the book of Ezra chapter 7. But this is a, a new year. It's a, the appropriate uh, occasion for a new beginning. And there is joy in the people because uh, they are uh, here gathered as one man. The, the text describes that the, the, the people is here as one man, unanimously uh, uh, gathered together. And it's not just for the celebration of a new year to do fireworks or, or, or uh, anything. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a feast like any other. The people is gathered together because they want to hear the word of God. The, they learned from Ezra that there was a law that was prescribed to them, and they want to hear the word of God. It's a new beginning for them, and a, a new spiritual revival is taking place because the, the, the people of God is taking the initiative to search the word of God. And they tell Ezra, they, they command Ezra to bring the book and read before them. And all this enthusiasm is the result of their desire to listen to the word of God. After many years, they finally have a, a priest, they finally have a temple, they finally have a reconstructed city. And uh, more important of all, they have the opportunity to, to hear the revelation of God to the people of God. So the text repeats twice the expression, all who could understand, men and women and all those who could understand. And, it, and this is due to the fact that uh, in addition to men and women, there were those who could understand. So there are two groups here, and it, it's due to the fact that many of those who were gathered here were either born in Babylon or went very young to Babylon. So many of those who were gathered there could not understand Hebrew as uh, Ezra would read the book in Hebrew because they either learned Aramaic, the language of Babylon, as their first language, or they lost the, their grasp of Hebrew for, uh, for being there for over 70 years. So many, for many of them, a Hebrew was a second uh, language. And so... Uh, many of these men and women who are here could not understand what was about to be read. But they are united. They are together as one man anyways because they are willing to learn from the law of the Lord. And they did not just uh, that one story of the law would be read. Oh, uh, Ezra, read for us the story of Joseph. Oh, no, no, that's uh, 17 chapters long, uh, uh, 13 chapters long. To, that's too long. Read us a chapter. Oh, read us a, a, a story. Uh, read us a, a verse with a 15-minute uh, devotional uh, telling us how we can have our best life now. Um, they wanted to, to listen to the, the entire law. They were ready they were listening attentively, as the text says, the entire morning, from, uh, from the morning to midday. Was, uh, that's about seven hours. Standing, hearing the word of God being read and taught. They were ready to read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The hunger would not move them from that place because they understood that the word of God was the food that they needed to receive. The heat would not move them from that place because they understood that the, God, uh, the word of God was what they needed to refresh in their souls. Their, the thirst would not deter them from hearing the word of God because they knew the word of God is the fountain that quenches the th their, their spiritual thirst. And the tiredness would not move them away either because 
the word of God is their strength, as the text also emphasizes. And that's how a great revival begins, with an enthusiasm for the word of God. What is your attitude towards the word of God? Do you desire to read the word of God? Different, unlike the, the, the people here, you have a Bible at home. Even if you can't have a, a physical copy of the Bible, you have a smartphone, you have a computer, you have access to the Word of God. Unlike those people, you don't have to write your own copy of the Bible. You know how to read, unlike many of those people. You don't need to wait until the next Sunday to hear somebody read the Word of God for you, because there is only one book in the community. Uh, the great question before us is, do you have enthusiasm for the Word of God? Does your heart thrill with the opportunity to gather together with the people of God to hear the Word of God being taught and read before you? When you are reading your Bible, do you devote uh, your, uh, uh, your whole attention to the reading of the Word, to the teaching of the Word, because you understand that it, this is the revelation of the God of the universe to his people. The, the, the enthusiasm for the word of God is the first essential element that uh, we need to have if we want the word of God to make a difference in our lives. If we want God to free, uh, to free us from mediocrity, if we got, uh, want God to revive our love for him, to uh, revive our obedience for him, to revive our joy in him. That's the first element. The second we see in verses four through six, it is the exaltation, exaltation of the word of God. Verses four through six. And Ezra describes stood in a wooden platform that they had made for the, uh, the purpose. And beside him stood uh, Metathiah, Shema, Anaiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maaseiah on the right hand, and Pedaiah, Mishael, Malkiah, uh, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, Meshulam on the left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. As he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Uh, so when we begin reading this, this chapter, we notice that the enthusiasm that they had for the word of God was not just a, a fruit of, a, of a, an excitement, an, a, a random excitement. Uh, let's get a, a gather together and uh, whatever happens, we are happy. Uh, no, uh, it was not a, uh, this was not an unthought uh, unthought of movement of the people, but it was an attitude of exaltation. And this attitude of exaltation for the, for the Word of God is first seen in their preparation for that situation, for that event. Uh, they invested time, they invested money, they invested their abilities to get everything ready for the word of God to be read. Uh, the, uh, there was a wooden platform that was made for that specific purpose. They had men on both sides of Ezra. The text says he opened the book, but you should not think about it as a well-bound book like this. It was a, a, a huge scroll. So Ezra could not stand the whole morning with a big scroll in his hand, like uh, unrolling one side and rolling the other as he read. So they prepared a wooden platform, they prepared men on both sides so that they could help Ezra as he read the book that he would concentrate only in reading, in the task of reading the book. So seven men here taking turns to unroll the book on one side and roll to the other so that uh, the, the, the word of God could be read smoothly and that uh, Ezra would have the energy to spend the entire morning doing that. So uh, this, uh, this, they, they had prepared, they had dedicated time and effort and thinking for this solemn situation. And the word of God is exalted when we get ready for it. 
we get ready, we prepare ourselves, we prepare uh, a quiet place for us to read it. We prepare our hearts to come to church, to listen to it, to have no distractions for the time that we have to listen to the Word of God. And they did that. And that's a, that's a, that, that preparation is, a, is something that shows how the, they exalted that moment, that the Word of God, the revelation of God was going, going to be read by them. And we need to do the same. Not in a, necessarily in a, uh, in a large-scale uh, gathering like this, but even in our own private time with the Word of God, we need to make preparations for that to be done quietly and that we can uh, use the most of that time, the quiet time with the Lord. The, the, th this attitude of exaltation to the Word of God is also seen in the position of the Word of God in relation to the people. We read in the text that uh, in verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. The attitude of exaltation to the Word of God is seen in the position that the Word occupies before the people, and in the position that the people assumes as soon as the, the Word of God is opened before them. The Word of God is above the people, and, 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 uh, and they show reverence and respect when they stand for the reading of the, the Word of God, and they, because they recognize that God is about to speak to them. They are not worshiping a book. The text says clearly that they worship the Lord. And they recognize that the Lord, is, the Lord is about to speak through the reading of His Word. And, that, and they cannot be inert. They cannot be just still. They cannot be indifferent to that solemn moment. They get ready. They stand. They lift up their hands. They lay their faces to the ground because it's the Lord who is about to speak. It's not just a man reading the Word of God. It's the Lord speaking through that man. This is a visual message of uh, readiness to receive the Word of God and to, uh, to act upon it. Uh, the, uh, we, we see that they, they bow down and they adore God. They worship God. When you read your Bible, when you are coming to the church to listen to the Word of God being preached faithfully, how do you approach this moment? Do you approach it with the understanding that God is going to speak to you? Or do you take it casually? this moment? Do we approach this moment with reverence, respect, and fear? Do you prepare to read the Word of God? Do you make preparations for it? Do you, when you are before the preaching of God's Word, the reading of God's Word, do you prepare your heart, asking the Lord to make your heart soft to receive the confrontation of His Word? We need to prepare to receive God's word, and that exalts him. That's a, the second essential element that needs to be present in our lives if we want the word of God to make a difference in our lives. The third element that we see in verses 7 through 8 is the understanding of the word of God. Verses 7 through 8 says, Also Joshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodia, Maaseiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelaia, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly. Or the idea is paragraph by paragraph, slowly. And they gave the sense 
so that the people understood the reading. That's the third essential element in our attitude to the Word of God. We, we need to understand it. Uh, as Ezra was reading the text above in the platform, uh, there were several men together with the people, explaining things to the people. And uh, the text, we could translate the text, translating, in, in, uh, instead of giving the sense, translating for some of the people. Uh, 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 from Hebrew to Aramaic. Uh, uh, the, those, even for those people who are not so much geographically, culturally, linguistically detached from the original context of the law of Moses, the word of God needed to be explained. How much do we think now, us, so far away in terms of geography, culture, and language, how much more do we need the word of God to be clearly explained? So we need to understand the word of God with clarity because clarity in understanding results in more accuracy in our obedience to the Lord. The more accurately we understand the word of God, the more accurately we can obey God. We need to be students of the word. We need to make efforts to understand the text that God has given us. And this means not to, to be content with just a, a ritual reading, a superficial reading uh, that you might do every morning or before you go to bed. Sometimes uh, in the morning, uh, thinking about w the day that you have ahead of you, sometimes in the evening, tired of the day that is behind you, uh, we, need, uh, we, we do not need to read the, the Bible just to, to check boxes in our reading plan. We need to invest our time. We need to invest in materials to study the Word of God that will help us to understand better uh, study Bibles, commentaries, dictionaries, Bible introductions. We need to invest our, our money in understanding the Word of God because me, this makes a, a life difference. Clarity in understanding uh, results in accuracy in obedience. Uh, most of the Bible is not, a, uh, is not difficult to understand. There are surely parts of the Bible that are more difficult than others, and Peter recognized that uh, regarding uh, Paul's writings in Second Peter 3. He says there are some of his writings that are hard to understand, that the, the wicked uh, twist it to their own judgment, their own destruction. But most of the Bible is easy to understand. God m gave us a book that we can understand. But if we reach to a passage that we do not understand, we need to write that down, we need to research, we need to, uh, to be, uh, have someone that we can ask to answer our doubts if we don't, do not understand. We need to value the moments, we need to prize the moments when the Word of God is being taught by people who, whom God has uh, enabled to study, dedicate more time to a more profound study of the Word, to teach with clarity uh, and authority. What we need by all means to seek to understand the Word of God. The Bible is too precious for us to read in just a casual manner. The more clear is the message, the more chance do we have to fulfill what God, God requires from us. Do not use the excuse that the Bible is a difficult book as, a, as a, a means to justify you not seeking to understand it, uh, understanding it, and thinking that you will not be uh, uh, held accountable for not seeking to understand what the Word of God says. Uh, if you don't know the law, and you break the law in your country, are you going to be excused for not knowing the law? It's assumed that you know the law of your country, and you obey it. You cannot plea uh, uh, ignorance, and you cannot plea ignorance with the Word of God either. God gave you, God gave us the means to understand it. And it's, it's really a, a question of life and death. Uh, if, we, if we go to Hosea chapter 4, uh, when the 
Hosea pronounces judgment on the people of Israel, we see clearly that understanding God's word is a, is a question of life and death. Uh, Hosea chapter four, verse six, says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you, you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. So it's a matter of life and death. People are destroyed because they do not know the word of God. And it's a matter really of life and death. We cannot plead for our ignorance to be uh, uh, claimed innocent for our obedience, disobedience. We need to understand the word of God so that we, uh, it may make a difference in our lives. The fourth element that needs to be present in our lives, in our attitude toward the word of God, is the effect of the word of God, the emotion really for the word of God. Verses nine through 12. It says, and Nehemiah, who was a governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, uh, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the word of the, of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions to make, uh, and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Understanding, intellectual understanding is not enough for the word of God to make a difference in our lives. It needs to, make, to cause an effect in our hearts. And this effect is, the, is this fourth element. The scene that we read here in verses 9 through 12 is, is, a, is moving, and it's weird at the same time. It, it is moving because all the people are mourning and weeping as they hear the law being read. Uh, maybe uh, because of the emotion after so many time without hearing the law and without understanding it. Maybe because of conviction of sin, as the, the law was read, they were, uh, it, their hearts were gripped with emotion because they understood their sins, as they understood that the, the, uh, the, the calamity they were in was the result of their disobedience in the past, their despise for the law of the Lord. But it's also a weird scene because uh, the people had to be commanded to stop crying. Stop crying. Uh, this is a special day. Go eat fat. Now, uh, the nutrition doctors today would not recommend that, but yeah, go eat fat and drink sweet wine uh, because this is a special day. Yes, the people had sinned. Yes, they had recognized that the reason for their judgment uh, from the Lord was their uh, despise for the word of God, but this, this is a day of joy. This is a day of rejoicing, uh, a holy day to the Lord, because this is a new beginning for the people of God. Uh, as, as weird as this scene uh, might seem to us, it teaches us a clear lesson about the word of God, that the word of God should not be received with apathy, with indifference, but it should cause in us genuine emotion. I'm not, I'm not advocating for emotionalism here, to play the piano as the final appeal is being made. The Word of God is, has to cause genuine emotion in our hearts. 
uh, as we understand it. Uh, understanding the Word of God should not be something taken for granted by us. We should rejoice when we understand. God is speaking to us, and we can understand. The God of the universe is speaking to His people, and His people can understand Him. And that's amazing. That's not something that should be taken for granted. Uh, do you rejoice when you understand the Word of God? When you, oh, I, I, this passage was so difficult to me, now I understand. What a joy to understand it. When God uh, enables you to obey Him better as you understand Him better. Uh, the, 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 the heart of the, the one who loves God uh, is sensitive to the Word of God. Uh, understanding the Word of God should, uh, should uh, affect our emotions. It should produce joy. It should produce relief. It should produce sadness, with, uh, as we understand our saying. It should produce fear from the Lord. It should produce trust. It should produce peace. Depending on what text are we reading, the Word of God should steer our, our, our emotions in different ways. And if it, this is not happening to you, it's not, this is not happen, happening to us as we read the Word of God, there must be something wrong with us. We are reading it wrong if the Word of God doesn't affect, uh, affect our hearts, it doesn't cause an effect in our emotions. But emotions are not enough. We know it. Verses 13 through 18 show us the last element that should be characterized, should characterize our attitude to, to the Word of God. Uh, thinking that the, the, the sermon was beautiful, uh, sharing a verse on Facebook, sharing a, 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 a uh, a pithy statement on your Instagram is not enough. The Word of God needs to be executed, needs to be obeyed. And that's what verse 13 through 18 show us. On the second day, the heads of the father's houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it uh, in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, uh, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it's written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for, for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim and all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made, uh, captivity made booths and lived in, in the booths. For from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. After they had prepared to receive the Word of God, after they had listened uh, attentively to the Word of God for hours, after they had understood clearly the Word of God as it was taught and explained and translated by the Levites, uh, after uh, they had their hearts gripped by the Word and, uh, and have rejoiced, in having obtained understanding of the Word of God, now the leaders of the houses, uh, of the people, of the families, they gather together to consider the Word of God, to study, to ponder on the Word of God. They want to understand exactly what they had been taught the last day. They want to give attention 
to the word that was just preached the last day. And it, 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 it is in interesting that it says in the second day, not the same day. This was not a decision made just in the, the heat of the moment. We are now happy, we are now, uh, our, our hearts are gripped by the word of God, let's do something now. No, they came the, last, in the next day because they want to give careful attention. They do not want to act on their emotions. So they came to study, to see if there was something specific uh, ahead of them that they should do, that they could do to obey the word of God. Uh, and so they, they come to, to, to Ezra. Ezra, let's uh, consider what you have just taught us the last day. Uh, you have taught, uh, taught us a lot of things. We have read five books, uh, the five books of the law before us. But we want now that you help us to see if there is any specific way that we can obey the Lord today or maybe the next day. Uh, there, is there something, th something before us that we should do that we are not doing? In fact, there was something just ahead of them was the Feast of Booth, the Feast of the, 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 the Tabernacles, the Feast of, of the Seventh Day that uh, was a memorial for Israel uh, of their pilgrimage, of their wandering in the wilderness uh, after they had been delivered from Egypt. And this is a law that has, is described in Leviticus chapter 23. And so they go back to that text, study specifically what we should do to obey God in a specific way. This in fact is really a new beginning for the people of God. The, the, the text describes here that they, the people of Israel had not obeyed this specific law since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. For over a thousand years, God's people despise his word. And now it's a new year, a new beginning. We will obey God's word. We want to understand it so we can obey it. This new generation uh, is here before Ezra with very great rejoicing. So it's a, uh, it highlights the joy that the people has, not only in understanding, as we saw in, in verse 12, but now the joy that they have in the opportunity that, that, uh, that is before them to obey God in a specific way. The word of God made a huge difference in this generation of the sons of Israel. And the word of God can make a huge difference in your life and in my life. But we need to obey it. We need to put it in practice in specific ways. We need to follow the example of these people. Do not be lazy to examine the text and to examine our own lives in a careful way manner to figure out, to discover if there is anything specific in front, of, in front of us where we can demonstrate our obedience, our submission to the will of God. What does this text command me to do? Uh, what attitudes in my life do I need to change as a result of what I see in this text? Is there a sin in my life that I need to confess that I read in this text? There are, are there protections that I need to put around me uh, because of what I see in this text? Are there words that I need to remove from my vocabulary based on what I see in this text? Are there activities that I need to stop doing because of what I see in this text? Uh, with which people should I involve, get in, more involved as a result of this text? Which people should I avoid as a result of what I see in this text. Uh, in what specific way can I serve based on what I, what I see in this text? Do I need to, to look for help because of what I see in this text? There, is there anything I, I can pray because of what I see in this text? We need to search our lives. We need to search the text so that we can uh, find specific ways where we can obey God. And the obedience to the word of God will bring joy in our lives. 
if we are not experiencing joy in our lives. One of the reasons for that might be that you are not submitting your will to the will of God. You are not uh, being uh, obedient to the word of God in a specific ways. You are not searching your life. You are not searching the word of God to obey him in a specific way. And if, if we do not want a life of mediocrity, if, if we want a life of full joy in the Lord, despite our circumstances, we need to examine our lives and see if these elements are present, if they characterize our attitude to the Word of God. And as we uh, become more and more committed, as we become more and more faithful to the Word, He can use us in ways that we can never imagine. As God used fra uh, frail, simple, ordinary men throughout history in astonishing ways, He can use us as we commit to His Word and are faithful to His Word. Amen.